Welcome to today's session of Can We Talk? My name is Deidre Moss and I am the host. I'm an educator, motivator, and a talk connoisseur. Today, we will be talking about natural resources. We've invited Mr. Prescott Smith to help us dissect this topic today. Mr. Smith is the president of the Bahamas Fly Fishing Industry and Association and the Bahamas Sports Fishing and Conservation Association and co-founder of the Bahamas Natural Resources Foundation. Um, if I've gotten any information incorrect, you could feel free to correct me. And at this time, I will pass the virtual mic to our guest so that he can introduce himself. Yes, thank you very much for having me. Um, well, most of all, you know, I'm very passionate about conservation, but not, I think I need to be very clear, not the way conservation is typically practiced, because you can have one side of it is very important with the science. And, and you know, that's the particular resource that you might be focusing on. But to me, it's very important as a combination of both the human component. How do these resources empower uh, people? And so that is, that is something that needs to be applied more in the conservation arena throughout the world. So to me, it includes the human. How does communities uh, benefit? and empowered through the resources that we have. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Smith. And so you're so passionate about what you do. I asked you to introduce yourself and you just went off into talking about conservation, yes. which is fine. Yes. <laughs> because basically that's what you do. <laughs> so that's fine. Um, but I just want you to, you know, just tell us a little bit about your background for persons who may not be familiar. Yes, uh, well, you know Prescott Smith. I was I was born in in Stanyard Creek, Andros, and um, you know did a part of my education there. I moved to Nassau uh, at an early age and completed you know high school there, and I did a some time in Germany after high school. I came back to the Bahamas and then I joined the Bahamas Defense Force. And, you know, got a chap opportunity to travel throughout the Bahamas and lots of places around the world. I was a, a marine mechanic originally in engineering, but I tried to learn as much as I can, even on the seaman side. And after the Defense Force, what really drove me, um, I originally thought about just flying commercial jets, uh, but as I traveled throughout the Bahamas, I began to see so many things about my country that I had no idea existed. We were not taught these things in school. And so I, you know, began to follow a path of trying to share the wealth of our country and what motivated me more is, as I tried to do it, there was just resistance, which was confusing to me at first. And I thought it would be a obvious thing that persons would want to, you know, let Bohemians know how wealthy the country is and people can make better decisions. But, you know, you know human nature sometimes can be uh, very self-driven. And so the more opposition I receive, the more I begin to put time into research. And it really took me on a global journey to understand that conservation was much more to it, uh, you know, the way we were taught. And so I began to research resources all over the world. And that, was, you know, that has been a 30 year journey for me. And wherever you can find gold and diamond and copper and platinum. Uh, but one thing became very clear to me as I began to look at these resources, not only 
I realized that we were very wealthy in the Bahamas and throughout the Caribbean, but um, the very model of how these resources were used, uh, exploited in most cases was never in the interest of the majority of the citizens. And so this path in my life, I, I don't think I had much of a choice in it. It just became more and more uh, an issue for me when I saw that so many people could be empowered if we were you know, very active in having a different model uh, as we practice uh, conservation and the use of these resources, you say? But that's a bit of background how my life journey got on this path. Thank you. And I just want to mention those persons who are on the, in, in this meeting with us tonight. Um, we have a few persons, um, Ms. Cox, as you would have mentioned. I don't know if you want to mention who these persons are. You may be more familiar. Yeah, I see very passionate. I see, uh, we see attorney Code Smith. He was the ambassador for the environment who has been very active in helping us with landmark things in the Bahamas. Most Bahamians may not know. Uh, he fought to help us pass a historic legislation uh, for the fly fishing industry, which is a lot more than fishing. We can go into that a bit later. And like I told you, uh, Ms. Cox is one of the world's leading experts in our field from uh, Barbados. When you talk about Sagasso weed, uh, and when you, that's a very important uh, issue. Uh, you might look at it as just seaweed floating on the beach, but so much more uh, travels through these resources and meets the eyes. So um, it's connected to everything that we do when it comes to the environment in one form or the other. I see many other persons who uh, would be from the foundation, Natural Resources Foundation, and other persons who I know are toning in from all over the world. Yes. Thank you so much for joining us and welcome, welcome, thank you. And so I wanna talk about your various roles. I see where you would probably have to answer something so I'll get you when you come back in. Um, but I wanna welcome those other persons who are joining us while he's in a break. I don't know if anyone wants to comment, make a comment while he is out on break. Um, but if so, you can feel free to interject. Um, so I just wanted to talk about his various roles that he occupies as the, as I would have mentioned before, he has assumed so many roles um, as the president of the Bahamas Fly Fishing Association and the Bahamas Sport Fishing and Cons Conser Conservation Association, sorry, and the co-founder of the Bahamas National Resources Foundation. And so those are various roles that you occupy. And so I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about those roles that you uh, have assumed. Yeah, uh, you know, you, you hear the various names but it, they're all connected to you know, some form of resources. So uh, the Bahamas is a country with the largest flats in the world. And you know, we, we really got involved in trying to get legislation passed that would empower people using these resources that would benefit the country, but also about developing a conservation model that I spoke to earlier, that's really about empowering ordinary citizens. And so when you think of the Bahamas Sports Fishing and Conservation Association, again, it's not about fishing. Uh, the fact that the country has most of, mostly marine environment, there are about 85% marine environment. And so there are billions of dollars extracted from our waters in terms of marine resources that most behemoths uh, firstly are not even aware exists because we focus on commercial fishing for lobster, you know, for conch, for grouper, but most of the marine resources extracted in the Bahamas 
are, are taken through the recreational fishing industry. And those are persons who come here from all over the world. We have poachers that come here from Dominican Republic, from Cuba, from Honduras, from Japan, from China, because of the, the uh, you know, resources that we have here. So for me, these organizations is about bringing attention to the resources that outside of what we were taught and then sun, sun and sea. And so that's how the organizations really got involved. And then finally, the Bahamas Natural Resources Foundation, uh, there are billions of dollars in mineral resources that are extracted from our country. And we're not talking about 10, 20, 30 billion dollars. And most of it is done under the radar. Uh, it, uh, most of it doesn't even show up in our annual budget. So these, this is not unique to the Bahamas. It's exploitation in Haiti, Jamaica, all over the world. Uh, very wealthy individuals who figure that they will prey on the lack of awareness. And so the Bahamas is a country very rich in mineral resources. And again, this was a part that my life took because I didn't know about these things as a child. And then when I found out and tried to bring it forward and then being blocked by politicians and special interests, death threats, bribes, you know, I realized that it was not by accident that Bahamians did not know uh, the wealth of their country at the end of the day. So that's a bit of background of, of those associations. All of those things are connected to resources. And it's not about fishing, it's just that most of our country is the marine environment. And, and hence we need to, you know, really make a deliberate shift in how we bring information to the citizens of the country. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, like you, you would have mentioned, um, it's, it's not something that you really are, are taught um, growing up in, in, in some of our classes. We're not mostly thought, taught about history, but to really mm -hmm. um, do an inside intricate look at our natural resources and the wealth that the country possess is a totally different topic. And so I wanna thank you for being someone who's at the forefront of bringing attention to the resources that we have as a country um, is definitely maybe a, a little bit of a lonely road uh, because we tend to focus on other things. So um, I want to thank you for bringing awareness to um, uh, this topic. And so, um, and you mentioned some terms that most people may not be as familiar with. Um, you mentioned flats. So I don't know if you yes. want to explain those things. So I'm gonna, you know, actually, if you could just do a basic. Um, go over uh, really what it is as it pertains to natural resources for persons yes, who may yes. not fully be aware of, you know, what, what it is. Well, well, firstly, I have to thank you for persons like you for having such a show and even the questions you're asking me because uh, it's important to bring that clarification. So when you think of flats, think of uh, the Bahamas have the Great Bahama Bank, you have the Little Bahama Bank. So if you look at the geography of the Bahamas, you see vast amount of shallow water. And those shallow water have various depth. You can be in 20 feet of water on the Great Bahama Bank, or you can be in you know, two inches of water. So generally think of flats as any body of water that can be from an inch or two inches to six, seven feet of water. And it doesn't mean that the other uh, shallow water area, you know, doesn't make up the entire Great Bahama Bank or Little Bahama Bank. But in that flats environment, you have a lot of unique things happening. Uh, so you think of the mangroves. The mangroves are not gonna be out there in, in 50 feet of water, 20 miles off the coast in, in, in at that depth, right? You might have a deep channel with mangroves running along it, but in those flats, you have your nursery systems. So think of it as you're an adult, and when you are a baby, you have a kid in the garden where all the little children are. Same thing with the marine. 
So the Bahamas have the largest mangrove nursery system in the entire Western world, more than the United States, more than Mexico, Cuba, Honduras, Belize, Nicaragua. And again, these things were deliberately kept from our citizens, because if you look at you know, who controls the economy, they're gonna push you know, real estate, you know, sun, sand, and sea, big cruise ship, and the type of development that gives the citizen the kind of mindset that, you know, we have to wait for somebody to come in the country and develop something, and then we can get a job. And so what, what was inspiring to me is I found that these things were not by accident, because as I tried to bring the information forward, you know, it was just met with lots of resistance. And so that motivated me more. You know, I, I tried for like 10 years to get to the cabinet. I'm talking about 10 years straight. And then I eventually got to the cabinet and I thought I'd hit a home run. I said, well, after all these years now, and I went there for four and a half hours, prime minister, every minister in the country, in the room, I was invited back for three hours. All the permanent secretaries were there. And then my life took a very difficult path because now persons knew that I was aware of the true wealth of the country. And there were individuals who did not want Bahamians to know that. And for various reasons, you can have, let's just use me as an example. Let's say I'm with this very corrupt individual and I see, you know, like I said, Professor uh, Shelly Ann or uh, Attorney Codesmith, and I were mining, you know, all of this copper or bauxite, and we're making billions of dollars, but we don't want Deidre to know uh, these things are happening. And so you have that type of activity taking place in the Bahamas, in Haiti, in Jamaica, in Barbados, in Cuba, all over the world. And most of the citizens are not aware of these things. So even when we think of natural resources, we have so many resources. I mean, you could not even begin to count them. You know, your mangrove is a resource. Your mahogany tree is a resource. The salt, the, the sand, you know, the limestone, and you can go into thousands and thousands in so many different directions, you see? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you too. And then um, um, search into the comments. Um, but I, I want to ask you, since you mentioned um, that there are so many other groups that are basically benefiting from our natural resources. And is this, you know, should Bahamians be concerned uh, about you know, ab about this and how can we help to preserve our natural resources? Bahamians, every Bahamian ought to be concerned about this issue because first, uh, these, re these resources belong to you, but that's been in itself as a challenge. Let's just say that I'm gonna get very personal with this. If you and I were married to each other and I'm this abusive husband, and you're beating someone down and they don't have any self-esteem and they don't think they're worth anything. And so, first of all, you have to realize that the exploitation of these resources, people are stealing from you. And why I'm putting it very direct to this, and I'm gonna use former ambassador Code Smith. Let's say Code Smith and I, you live in a beautiful town with your children, you're drinking fresh water, and Codesmith and I want to mine a particular mineral that's just right next to your town. But now we start to use sulfuric acid to extract that mineral, and all of a sudden, you, you and your children start to get sick. You no longer could drink the water. And so, the resources belong to all of us, but you also have implications 
if you don't know what you have, you might say, oh, it doesn't matter. You know, that's because if I'm destroying the freshwater lands that your community is depending on, that affects you. If I'm destroying the nursery system at you, when you want fresh fish to feed your family or lobster or grouper, it's no longer there, it affects you. And so that's why the issue of natural resources cannot be just kept in isolation. And I can use example to show you where there are billions of gallons of the freshwater lands destroyed in Grand Bahama for mining limestone for over 70 years. Limestone leaves Grand Bahama. As you and I are having these, this conversation and goes into 11 different ports in the United States. What is most troubling about that is limestone doesn't even show up in our annual budget. Not $1, not $5, but yet tens of billions of dollars in limestone is leaving the Bahamas under the guise of a free port. So in a young country like the Bahamas, these individuals made sure that there's no written policy that says the limestone resources, mineral resources belongs to the Bahamian citizen, which means that every truckload of limestone, every truckload of sand, every truckload of aragonite leaves this country, the citizen should benefit for it. There is not one gallon of oil that leaves Norway that the Norwegian citizens do not benefit from. That's why they have the largest sovereign wealth fund in the world. There's no Norwegian who ever worries about paying their mortgage, losing their home, losing their car, medical bills for their children. It does not exist. They have 5 million plus in population and they have over 1 trillion in their sovereign wealth fund. That's not, you know, that's $1 trillion in the account. So technically every citizen is wealthy. We have way more wealth in Norway, but we have 11, 12 billion in national debt. And so these things affect every citizen, whether they realize it or not. But like I told you, like me, and I have to use myself as an example, we were all miseducated um, that, you know, we just have sun, sand, and sea. And as a result of that, the exploitation uh, continues. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, and so, you know, that's where awareness comes in. That's where knowledge sharing comes in to kind of, you know, um, shed light on these, these issues that are happening in our country. And this has been going on for years. And we have so many people who come and, you know, they talk about these issues and people, you know, try to silence them. But I think it's going to come to a head. It's going to come to a point where people are really going to realize what's, you know, really going on um and so i want to talk us to talk about as you would have mentioned before you talk about those groups they benefit from the rich resources and the wealth of the country and so when you consider you know when you consider these things i want us to talk about fines and penalties for these persons um well, first of all they've, they've committed treason against the bahamian citizens just most citizens are not aware the extent, these are very corrupt families who figure they can buy our political systems. But DJ, I want to emphasize what I shared with you earlier. It takes citizens like you, what you're doing uh, to help to bring about that change. So the fact that you have this show is a part of that process because that is what it's going to take to help to bring that awareness. But what is happening in us to us in the Bahamas, like I told you, I've studied it all over the world. It's not unique to us. It's happening to our brothers and sisters in Haiti, 
They got incredible gold mines. They got, I mean, mineral resources. And again, you see the level of poverty. But let's just go to South Africa. South Africa have alone one country of 54 on, on the continent have more platinum than any country in the world. As a matter of fact, all of the countries combined on planet Earth, but you have millions of people living in shanty town. No sewage system. Uh, some of them, their family will never eat a healthy salad while they're working in these mine shafts and so forth. And that can be, look at Jamaica with its bauxite. It doesn't matter that you have these wealth. It's how uh, the structure uh, to benefit the citizen. So it's known as the resource curse. You, you curse, you could be very wealthy in resources, but if it's not there to benefit the citizens and just a few, you end up with what we are facing throughout the region. But Bahamians can, you know, what you're doing and shed light and change this uh, for every citizen. So the Bahamas, like I say, we haven't scratched it. We just have uh, deliberate lack of policies uh, at the end of the day. And the miseducation I found is very critical. You know, I tried to bring this information forward for many years. And like I said, if I didn't see the deliberate attempts to stop it, then I knew that, you know, that it wasn't just by accident, you say. I wanna share something with you that, especially for you as a black female, it's important for you to know this. And I say this without any apology, because I have a natural bias in a positive way towards you, even over other males. It's not disrespect for our brothers, but you, uh, when you look at the continent we are from, Africa, I grew up Deidre, thinking that, you know, we were poor and slavery was about your skin color. And I, as I began to research resources, I realized that, you know, most of these resources I'm looking up is showing up on the continent of Africa or within that geographical zone around the world. So if you eat a chocolate bar, more than 70% of the world's raw material comes out of two countries in Africa, Ghana and the Ivory Coast. Most of the gold comes from Africa, most of the diamond. And so here is the richest continent on planet Earth that is supplying the wealth for France, Germany, England, the United States, Canada, Russia, Japan, China. But we have been marked all over the world as if we are inferior, we are cursed. And it's all a fallacy. It is all because they are extracting those resources, exploiting the continent, oppressing the people, and we are living a lot of that throughout the Caribbean. Those who colonized Africa, who sat in Germany in 1884, also colonized the Caribbean. So we're not just speaking English by accident. It was the British who colonized all through Africa. It's our brothers and sisters in Haiti speaking broken French. So the French were some of the biggest exploiters of the continent of Africa. And so if you go to the Dominican Republic, who's speaking Spanish, we're speaking English here, we're speaking English in Barbados, we're speaking English in Jamaica, you find it's the same issues you're facing all around the world. Yes. Thank you. Um, I think people have woke. I think people have come, come basically come into the understanding of who they are, um, and we understand that you know the process of slavery.
great then the traumatic effect on persons and definitely has had an effect on you know mindset and, and and thinking but i think that people are coming to the understanding of who they are and so um that is a shift and we're moving away from that mindset. So I, I don't think it's the same as it used to be, but um, I, I, there's still room, <laughs> definitely always room for growth. And so it, it definitely yes. is, uh, it's, it definitely is, um, it's kind of overwhelming to, to think about these things. And, and if we're looking to make progress as a nation, these are the things that we have to um, talk about it's it's fun to have entertainment and to get a good laugh I love a good laugh it's, entertainment is great but we really need to unravel and really lift the veil over these other issues these th these things that are happening in our country if we want to make progress and we can't continue to sweep these things under the rug and really not address um, these prevailing issues in our country and so um, I, I know there's someone else. I don't, I'm not going to call your name, but if you want to interject, feel free to do so. Um, I definitely want to hear from you if you, you know, want to add anything to this um, discussion today. So uh, feel free to do so. But um, if you're available, Mr. Smith, I want to, oh, well, there's two Smith. <laughs> Peace, Smith. Um, well, I'll, 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 I'll see you're dealing with something, but um, I want to talk about the, no, no my worries. apologies, I was just making that no, adjustment. No, no, no. Yeah, you don't need to on. explain. Listen, you're busy. Yeah. I understand that. You're busy. I, I yeah. get that. Um, and you got a lot of things you're juggling and, and there's a lot of things going on. But Mr. K. Smith, I don't know if you want to add. I want just want to give you an opportunity. Um, I don't know if you want to jump in. Um, well, Ms. Boss, thank you very much uh, for asking me to intervene. Um, Prescott is a, is a man of my own heart. He, he struggles, he has been struggling, he's been in the wilderness fighting what he fights for for many, many years now. And um, I know we met initially um, when I was doing some fights myself publicly. And, um, and that was over the waves. And we've been close friends for now over 20 years. And so the point I make, um, I've had the opportunity to listen to part of what you're talking about. Um, and uh, to answer one of your questions, if I can, and that is what can you do or what can Bahamians do? Um, and, um, and that is to speak up. Speak up, do not be afraid to speak. Now, I, I must say that it comes with the possibility of a lot of stress and struggle and attacks. And um, you have to be aware, minded of that, and you have to be to take the battle, um, take the battle on. But nothing is gonna happen unless you say to people, yes, listen, I understand, and I know, and I want you to protect this for us, the Hamans. And Prescott is 100% correct. Notwithstanding, we have a lot of natural resources in our country. People, one, do not understand the significance of it to, to us and that they are there. And so we need to speak up. We need to learn. We need to take notice of what is there. And um, of course, the one thing that has been a lot of talk recently although I know I brought it up when I was in my previous life in politics, back in 2002 to be exact, 2000, yeah, 2003, when um, Prescott just mentioned South Africa, when um, there was an environmental summit in, in South Africa. Oh, well, it is, I don't know if my face is good enough to be on this thing with a beautiful woman like you, but um, let me not be disrespectful and put my camera on, you know, because that was not the case. Uh, and there I am. <laughs> but the, the, the point, yeah, the point I'm making is, we had an opportunity. I had I had the opportunity of appearing and representing the Bahamas uh, in South Africa at the Environmental Summit there in 2002, um, and we had the opportunity, and I had the opportunity of asking my technical people to broach the discussion of carbon credits. Um, so in the Bahamas can benefit from what we have. 
because we have people like Prescott's father, Charlie Smith, long time ago, he's passed away now, but long time ago, it was people like him who kept our environment pristine. I mean, and many others, and all of, even your grandparents, my grandparents, all of us, we, we didn't overfish, for example. We didn't just pollute. There were some natural pollutions happening. And like Prescott said, over the last 70, 80 years or so, you're talking about mining happening in Grand Bahama. And it was done under the radar. So that the families or the few people who were benefiting from it, they benefited them and they continued to benefit over the many decades. And, and there is, and for those people who are in the mantras, we all know that there's a lot of other people in Grand Baham, not Grand Baham, so in Andrews, who are now thinking of trying to bring personal, private um, uh, mining to benefit them themselves and not, not to benefit the country. And we need to stop that because if you have things of that happening and you have the structures designed so that it simply benefits one family, that's wrong. And we need to understand that if you do it, and if you don't do it properly, then it's going to harm our environment. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about the water table into which they wanted to, to, to dig. We can't have that. Um, I don't know if you, you look, you're a very young looking lady. So you don't remember when we used to mine, uh, bring water from Andrews in that new province. Um, and that was on a regular basis. And that's how we got our water yes. um, for new Providence. And water was brought by barges. And if you were to go to, to Andrews now and you go to, to South, to North Andrews, sorry, you will see the big tanks. I mean, these are built in tanks where they collected the water and the water um, was pumped in there and then it was pumped on the barges and brought in Asso. Um, and, and that was going like that until I was an adult. And I now have gray hair, but you know, I'm not that old, <laughs> you know, but the point is yeah. it happened. <laughs> it happened in my lifetime. Yeah. And so, the, the, the main thing is, Ms. Moss, is that we need to encourage our Bahamians to speak up, speak up, get involved. There will be a lot of people attacked, and you'll be surprised to know who will come after you and how, because they don't always come with a cutlass in their hand. They come smiling, and then they do something to you in, in between. And so, but um, unfortunately for my family and Prescott, as well, he suffered the same thing as me. Uh, and we may not be family by birth, um, but you know, Smith, Smith, they say they be all over the place. <laughs> you can find us everywhere. But the point is, is that we have been involved in this kind of fight for a long time. And um, uh, we have to encourage everyone to participate. I can't overemphasize it. Um, and um, the, when it comes to carbon credits, this is the one thing that will bring us back up to speed because we have owned the people who've been messing with our natural resources. They want to just take it and give it away. Most of they want to sell it. But we have been able to figure out that, you know, we can keep it where it is. We can keep it exactly where it is. Just how the old people just kept it just the way it was. Just keep it there. But who are messing around with our um, uh, ozone layer because of the, the pollutions that they're doing, they are all now understanding that they must pay people like us to keep it as we've always kept it. They did it for Brazil. They're doing it for Belize and a, a lot of other countries around this world. Prescott knows them better than me. But a lot of these countries are benefiting millions and billions of dollars. Um, we have right there in, in, in um, uh, Central Andes or in the area just off Fresh Creek, and they are doing God knows what in our waters. You, yes. You're talking, I don't, I don't know if you understand Ms. Moss, but and Prescott is a captain, he's really is a captain. I mean, he's a he's qualified captain, but he can tell us how deep the waters are between New Providence and Andrews. You're talking yes, about a couple of thousand, thousand, six thousand, six thousand feet plus. Mm -hmm. So when you go right here, uh, I don't know if you were here in, in, in Nassau, Ms. Moss, but when you go right to Tifton Key, or Clifton Point, where the BC is, the BC is another set of pollution going on in our country. And if you take a stone and you take a stone and you can throw 50 feet off the shore, a thousand foot of water. Yes. Um, 
I remember Prescott and, and Ms. Morse that um, I'm a certified diver. When I was in Parliament and serving as ambassador for the environment, I, I decided that what I need to do is to dive so I can understand what is under our water. What, uh, what am I going to try to do in my position to help what we have? But I needed to understand what we had. And so I went diving with one of my friends who took me diving. He's not from the Bahamas. He's not from the Bahamas. And, and so for him, he said, Code, you need to see it. And I went right off of Golden Key. Golden Key is, if you were to stand on Clifton Beach, uh, Jaws Beach, you look out to the sea uh, to the west, and you see that there's a, a small key right off, right off the coast. That's Golden Key. Um, Golden Key is a very pristine place because it has a lot of birds and so on. In their migratory um, transition, they stop there every year. Anyway, we went to Golden Key, and you have all these beautiful elk um, reefs and, and the beautiful. I mean, it is really beautiful. And the guys that follow me had motivation for me to follow him, and I followed him. And he wanted me. I didn't know he was taking me there. He wanted me to see the dark ocean right off of Golden Key. And we went, and before I knew it, Prescott. It was black. I mean, when I say black, I'm talking black. Yeah, it goes down like 1,000 feet of water. Right, I, I realized I was going down and down and down. And so because I had to use my equipment to make sure I pump myself to get back up to the surface. And I'm telling you that it was just right off of Golden Key. But I was going down and I would have gone, my, my, my watch told me, the watch being in the instrument that we, we, we were on our hands, told me that I was 200 feet, or I think 250 feet already. And as a relatively uh, novice diver, I'm not supposed to be that deep. As far as they wanted me to dive was maybe 80 feet. So, but the point I'm making that was already to, that where I was, I was 200 feet below. And so it's incredible. All, of the, all of that beautiful thing I saw with my eyes and I came back up and I was amazed and he wanted to take me back, but I said, no, I can't trust my friend because he wanted me to go off the edge again. I said, no, 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 I, I can't live with that. I can do a lot of things, but I don't go that deep. But the point I'm making is, there you have it. You have, I forgot the name of the the, 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 the things that we have in the Exomi Keys. Uh, when you go to Exomi Keys and if you have a chance, go please. And if you go in the little boats that the guys take you from key to key to take you on fishing for different purposes, and you look at the water as I was going at maybe 15, 20 knots, which is pretty fast on, on, the, on the boat. And I look down at the sea and I'm 30 feet, 30 feet in 30 foot water. But it's like I can look straight to the bottom. We're moving fast, but I could see everything. That's how beautiful it is. And so all of the talk that you hear about how beautiful it is looking from space to the Bahamas. It is surreal. It really is surreal. So all of that, what we have, all of it that I would have seen and that you would see if you were to do this, all we can get paid to keep it. And so I think the Bahamas as a country did not really understand it. And um, I can tell you that um, the, the lesson that I've had, that I've learned and I'm still learning um, is something for us to behold. And so I try to teach my children about it. And um, if we can teach our children um, to, to understand it, accept it, appreciate it, and then keep them here, grounded here. They don't have to stay in the Bahamas if they don't want to, but grounded in the Bahamas to make sure they keep it the way it is. And that's it. Thank you for sharing that um, and sharing your experience in your role as you would have been former Minister of Environment, am I correct? No, not Minister, I was a, as an ambassador. An ambassador. ambassador yeah. We didn't have a ministry for the environment at the time. Um, we lobbied for it, but um, at the time, the government, uh, we didn't really formulate it. We formulated it, but it didn't come to fruition before we left office. Um, um, and so we, fought, we felt, interestingly enough, under the ministry for, I think it was health, um, only because that was interesting. Well, Very only, interesting. Be, <laughs> no, only because um, I think Mr. Christie, who was the Prime Minister at the time, understood the importance of what I lobbied for. And um, it was easier to facilitate, I think, in the Ministry of Health. Marcus Bethel was technically 
the minister for the environment or responsible for the environment. But um, all of my administrative things fell under him. Um, and um, but but it was only at the ambassadorial level. I, I was not in the cabinet. Didn't uh, have any interest of wanting to be there. Um, I just simply wanted to do what I could do. I learned from people at Prescott, and there's another person who is not on your your chat. Um, Sam Duncan. I'm sure you've heard of her. Um, Samantha Duncan. She she is definitely um, uh, an environmentalist at heart, and I tell people all the time she made me a tree hugger. You know, and so. <laughs> And uh, press scholars just kept me hugging trees all these years. And so, you know, um, definitely you know, um, it's something that we must um, uh, take advantage of. And I would encourage you to, I don't know how often you go to the islands, but go to the islands. And if you can, go in the seats. If you, if you can't swim, that's fine, go in the boat. And, and then, um, of course, you don't need to be a swimmer in order to scuba dive, so, okay. Thank you so much for your input. I, I really appreciate it, especially as you would have occupied that role and, and, and feel free to interject at any time. And so I, I just wanna ask about recommendations to put forward as we seek to create better awareness for our natural resources um, amongst Bahamians. Um, what recommendations would you put forward? Well, it's very, you're asking some very good questions, okay? First of all, as a country, I mean, and this applies to all of us, as much as I've been involved in researching natural resources, there's so much about our country that we don't know. So first of all, our country needs to do a proper inventory of what we have, and then you have to put policies in place, how those resources are used. And the key thing is, to benefit the citizens of the country. Because as, as uh, former Ambassador Cole Smith pointed out, let's say Deidre, you and I are mining sand, but we're taking it from an area that is a cung breeding ground, when we could easily take it from an area where it naturally is coming in, but it's not a cung breeding ground. So you have to know, just like home, you want to use the bathroom, particular reason, you cook in the kitchen, you sleep in the bedroom. The environment is just like that. And so recommendations, we, and these are things that has happened deliberately. So it's, it does, it's not by accident that we, I can show you documentations where I copied every cabinet minister in the country uh, trying to share information with the entire Bahamas. Uh, I was on the council of the Bahamas National Trust, as Code Smith was, and we we're clashing with these families who don't want you to know this information. So I have these documents, thousands and thousands of official communication. And these families sit right here. You know, I was sharing scientists today because we we did a, a field trip in the interior of Andros. And what was so amazing about this DG, you would think you was on some plains in Africa. The beauty, the fresh water things. How many Bahamians know we have rivers in the Bahamas here on Andros? These things are not in school. How many the children all think we just flamingos and inagua? We have them in many islands in the Bahamas. So we have to know what our many resources are. Uh, this information needs to be spread in our education system from primary school. And most of all, put policies in place where as you identify the various resources, how do they benefit the citizens of the country? Because most of all, you can have all the diamond and the gold and the copper in the world, but if it's being exploited for the benefit of the few, then you can be like so many other countries where they're being exploited, poverty, depression, and uh, well, 
like I said, uh, you know, I put a post out. I remember putting this out. I haven't found anyone who can challenge this yet legitimately. And this is from studying resources for over 30 years around the globe. Africa is the richest continent in terms of mineral resources, right? And so when you think of the Bahamas or the Caribbean on the whole, and you look at you're in Guatemala, whether you're in Nicaragua, whether you are in Belize, I see a good friend of mine from Belize watching who's very active down there. Victor show is on here. And Victor can tell you a lot. He's very active in Belize. It power ordinary citizens there, developing their whole sports fishing industry. Uh, Belize has incredible flats. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, Victor was involved in a fly fishing program in the schools. And we are talking about doing that between Belize, the Bahamas, Cuba. And so you have, we have to come together like you're doing. You, this platform, do not underestimate how important what you're doing, but it is about bringing us together, not just Prescott Smith, bring Cole Smith, bring Victor, bring Shelly Ann from Barbados, and you will find that we have a common issue, problems. We are resources rich, but they're being exploited with the same model that has exploited Africa for 500 years and more. There's a huge uh, proposal to mine 5,000 acres of limestone here in Andros. And where do they want to mine it? In the, the island with the largest freshwater lens in the country. The island with the largest mangrove nursery system in the country. The island with the largest pine forest in the country. Victor can tell you in Belize, there's a proposal uh, one of the same companies that's been exploiting Grand Bahama for decades, they now want to do a huge limestone mining operation in Belize. And these things are done in isolation because if Deidre, you and I are not talking, and you and Code Smith are not talking, and you and Shelly Ann are not talking, or Victor, then we don't know that. We are all being exploited, but we are in different compartments. I have no idea the same thing happening to you is happening to us here in the country. So in answering your you know, question a bit more, when you think about the Bahamas and while all of these ecosystems are connected, not that the Bahamas is more important than Cuba, more important, but we are blessed with resources that one support the other. So the Bahamas has the largest mangrove nursery system in the entire Western world. But when you go to Belize, you can see the mountains. You can see they, they're growing, making their own chocolate, coffee, so imagine the connection between Cuba, Belize, Haiti. We're all rich in resources, but are they there to benefit the citizens? I want to share something with you. Think about having the largest cruise ship port. Yet all the cruise ships in Belize, they're paying an environmental tax. There is no cruise ship company in the Bahamas that is paying one dollar environmental tax. But you have five million people coming here. If the government put this a twenty dollar tax, that's a hundred million dollars for cleaning our environment, recycling, environment, uh, education in the University of the Bahamas, BAMSI, to support marine biologists, marine environmental scientists, research. So we're not poor. Code mentioned. The US Navy has six sites on Andros. 
If they can pay $300 million for one base in, in Japan, why are we only getting $11 million? Yeah. Why, why is four to seven million gallons of water barred from Andros, not just for you know, 30 years, but not $1, but yet the water was sold in Nassau. Uh, the day we're having this conversation, Deidre, you realize that 70% of the water, the fresh water in New Providence or being sold, it's being sold to your water and sewage company by private companies. Now you could imagine how did our country get like this, where you're hijacking your water company and they're now selling your fresh water, which they get to take out the ground for nothing, for nothing. And your national water company. But most Bahamians don't even know this. And more than 70% of the water sold by the water and sewage company, which is your company, is being brought by from private companies. So, but you know, I want to share with you how the awareness that you're bringing about is how the change will take place. Because most of these things are done in secrecy. They feel they can cut deal with, influence our political system. You know, they want to fund your know, campaigns, their polit political. And like I say, it's not unique to the Bahamas because I studied it all over the world. And it operates in secrecy. And Code made a valid point. He had to rescue me many times from threats and the bribes and everything else. When you take these issues on, sometimes those who come smiling looking like me and you, but they're not thinking like me and you. They're no friends. They're not friends. And that's the reality, Ms. Moss, is that um, um, those are there need to understand that we must speak up. Uh, and more importantly, I should say this, I, if, if I could take um, uh, position of Prescott, uh, and that is that the powers that be, that is to say the members of parliament, those people who are holding this ministerial this and this directorship that, they need to understand that their jobs are not to become personal with anyone. They need to take the high road all the time, all the time. And their jobs are to find the ways to benefit the health Bahamian people. We have the resources. Think about what Prescott just said. Is it not ridiculous to think someone is going to take your natural resources that's yours, take it out of the ground, and sell it to you? Um, and, 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 and then not, not do a good job, because we still need to do some reverse, uh, uh, reverse process, uh, process here as well as in some of the family islands. Um, um, for example, I mean, what is it or why is it that we are not doing what we used to do before? And, and, so, and then if we were doing it, what was the benefit being given directly to Andrews? And I can tell you that when Mr. Vincent Pete was a member of parliament and I worked very kindly with him, I know he was a very busy minister. He did a lot of things for, for a lot of things, but he had to fight for those things. Why? And his community was the place where we get a lot of our water from, for example. Why is it the Grand Bahama, especially around the fishing pole road, was is so badly developed and organized? I don't know if you remember when we had Hurricane Dorian. I, I mean, a lot of things happened in that part of, of Grand Bahama. A lot of people, a lot of people were hurt, and I believe even that, or at least went missing. You don't know who or where they are. But yeah, that's a very powerful point you're making, Code. I want to share yeah. something about Grand Bahama. While listening, uh, just the, just one island in the Bahamas, the amount of revenue that is generated in Grand Bahama, geographical location and environment, could cancel the national debt every country in the Caribbean. Now, this isn't something I, if I make a statement, 
I can always back it up with the evidence. So I'll yes. just share with you. Limestone, as I told you, Deidre, is being shipped into 11 different ports in the United States, from DuPont to Martin Marietta Material. So when you think, I fish clients who come to my lodge and say, Prescott, I'm the largest road builder in Alabama, and I'm buying all my materials to roads in Alabama from Grand Bahama. So let's think of limestone. We look at it and just say, what is, what is the real value of limestone? Besides air and water, limestone or calcium carbonate, which is the header, because limestone has the sun, aragonite, limestone, they are all calcium carbonate in different forms. Mm -hmm. Besides air and water, it is the most used resource on planet Earth. You and I could not be doing what we're doing right now without limestone. So when you think of your television, your cell phone, all glass in the world, think of fiber optics. What does that mean? It can't happen without limestone. So the communications, the fiber optic cables on the, and so you think of the monies being wired, Wall Street, New York, how does all of these things happen? And yet the Bahamas, this raw material is building skyscrapers in New York, in Canada, in North Carolina, highways, building homes, warehouses, the list goes on. Or every glass that you drink out of, it's all material, all glass in the world, the windshield, ah, the windows in your home. The two main ingredients in all glass is sand and limestone. And so only air and water is used more than calcium carbonate on planet Earth. And yet we look at it as what is, it's only rock. That's what we were told. So it's called Bahama Rock in Freeport. Let's look at other resources. Grand Bahama have oil storage terminal facilities because of its strategic deep ocean. It's one of the global shipping lanes in the world, the Northeast Northwest Providence Channel. China has a huge port in Grand Bahama. Why, why could not, why as a government, we did not enter an agreement to say that we own the majority shares in that port? Why is every oil tanker, container ship, cruise ship passing through our internal oceans and nobody pays $1 environmental tax? Why are 50,000 yachts fishing in our waters every year and we are yet to charge the first penny environmental tax? They can dump their sewage in the water. They can they dump do. their sewage in the water. And this is what is happening. And we treat this country that we claim we love and it's so beautiful. And yet the exploitation, and that's why I said to you, the country with the largest sovereign wealth fund in the world has a storage facility, blending facility on Grand Bahama, Stat Oil, as the Norwegians. And yet we're making billions of dollars for them and we don't have the first dollar in a sovereign wealth fund yet, right? The former president of the United States, they have one of the largest oil storage facilities called Buckeye in Grand Bahama, Shell, Luke Oil. All of these oil tankers come in 24 hours a day. If I show you a live shot now of the ships, the cruise ships, the container ships, the oil tankers, and yet, we have not collected the first dollar. It, the issue in our country is not a lack of resources. As I said to you, you can have all the diamond and the gold and the copper, but which if you don't have policies put in place to benefit the citizens. And this issue, 
is an issue that if future generations are to be able to have a comfortable life in our country, it must change for our survival. Yeah. One of the most critical things about this, as I shared to you, if the Dominicans are fishing here, the Hondurans, the Cubans, the Americans, the Japanese, the Chinese, they're telling you that the nursery system in our country is important to all countries. The nursery system in Belize is important to all these ecosystems are connected. So if the Bahamas have these resources and we are destroying them, as Cole pointed out, we're not looking after them. We're not being uh, receiving the benefits. And then we continue to have people come in and then we say, oh, they can just mine and Andros because we need some jobs. Or we can just mine and make Warner because we need some jobs. Our country is gonna be permanently destroyed. And once they finish, they're gonna move on and somewhere else. And then we will be living in extreme poverty where you have extreme wealth and the majority of the citizens and they will look back and say, what did Deidre or Prescott or Code do about it? So I'm sharing this, but I'm very optimistic because what you're doing is how the change is going to take place. Yes. To do more of these shows where I would like to show the public this information. So Stevie Wanda and Ray Charles <laughs> can see clearly it. see it. <laughs> definitely, well, you definitely, yes. definitely have to continue this and um, come bring this back. Mr. Smith, Mr. K. Smith, definitely have to bring you back and definitely, you know, talk about these issues because I know it's so much, it's so much to go through and we cannot contain it within an hour time. And so I want to welcome you back. I'm going to share my contact with you, Mr. Mr. K. Smith, so we can yeah. uh, talk about, you know, moving forward and, and talking about whatever issue you want to highlight. And also, peace Smith, to give you some more time to continue to highlight these issues. But I want to give other these other persons who are here on the platform, if you wanted to um, have a have ha, um, share your thoughts, um, give a quick minute if you want to add uh, your piece. Feel free to interject and let me know. Um, <clears throat> but I want to go to our fast talk segment, Mr. P. Smith, and I hope that you can get through these second these questions in a minute. So right, you give it sixty on. seconds. Right. Sixty seconds, Mr. P. Smith. First question: Do you think the relevant authorities are effective with preserving natural resources? We're not there yet. We have a new Ministry of Natural Resources. I know the minister is committed, but he's also fighting uphill battle. These are very powerful forces. And what is needed is what you're doing, because this type of change doesn't just happen by you know, snapping your fingers. Uh, corruption in every country when it comes to this kind of wealth. And so you know, we have to change happens when we advocate for it. And we, as Code pointed out, we have to be the change agent because it doesn't happen otherwise. So we're not there yet with the policies, but I can tell you, it, it just, he talked about, you now have a Ministry of the Environment, you now have Ministry of Natural Resources. So now we got to fill that cupboard with policies that benefit the citizens, yep. Thank you. Number two, what can we do to create greater awareness for our natural resources? Very good question. You have the Bahamas Natural Resources Foundation. Uh, I think if every Bahamian was to, if you just had 10 or 20,000 Bahamians join it tomorrow, you would have a country that would be free because you do have, see, we can talk a lot of things that you divide it. it. You can go and join the foundation for simple as $5 and become a member get it, it I made sure being one of the persons uh, involved in it uh, that the power gives to the, the members. And so you're not just joining something and it's a token membership. You're, you're joining something that where you legally can say to the government, this is what must happen. So imagine if 20,000 Bahamians join, 
no political party will ever be elected again unless they put in the sovereign wealth fund, put the policies in place with the resources, because you now have- Okay, question three, that's your 60 seconds. Do yeah. you think the humans appreciate natural resources? No, I think there's a lot of miseducation. There's a people, you know, I shared this information and people got in the space using it for political mileage. So there's a lot of confusion out there. You know, people just think, oh, payments say, yeah, but a Aragonite. And most people might not even know what it is. <laughs> As I said, you all Aragonite, sand, limestone, they are all calcium carbonate. You see what I mean? So that doesn't help the citizens when you have misinformation being put out there. That doesn't bring clarity. And there's thousands and thousands of resources. So it's not just sand, you know, limestone or aragonite or salt. So that's, we have to show behemoths that this wealth is, is real. It's not a figment of your imagination. And, uh, you know, you can't just make bogus things about, I'm going to put this money in your account and so forth, because you can benefit from, every citizen benefit from these resources and just by having better education system, better medical facility, infrastructure, you know. Uh, and okay, that brings us to question four. That's the 60 yeah. seconds. What is one piece of advice that you would offer as it pertains to preserving our natural resources? Yes, uh, code made a valid point. If we, and these are factual information. Having the largest mangrove nursery system in the entire Western world means that if we protect them, it keeps producing more lobster, count, grouper, and thousands of marine resources. So we can't allow the exploitation uh, of developers who want to destroy them. Having a freshwater lens uh, in us, uh, instead of allowing it to be destroyed by one mining company, we got Bamsi there. You talk about bringing in over a billion dollars worth of food, food security, forestry to protect your forest. So you can use your resources in a sustainable way instead of just to the benefit of a few, uh, to the detriment of the majority, you say? Thank you so much for the benefit of the majority. And so I wanna, I wanna thank you for engaging in our fast talk segment and that brings us to the end of our session. I just wanna open it, open up the room for any commentary and give you the last thoughts. I'm gonna just open it up. You mentioned Victor from Belize. I don't yeah. know if he wants to add any commentary or Ms. Taylor, if you would like to add anything before we um, close. And then Mr. K. Smith, I'm gonna come to you. And then come to you last, uh, Mr. P. I would like for both of them to weigh in. Let me tell you about <laughs> Stacey Taylor. She's a behemoth female who runs a family owns a fishing lodge or fly fishing. These are things behemoths need to know about, but they need support. You know, we have the largest flats in the world, but the support is not there. And I'm hoping, you know, we have a big meeting coming up on the 8th of December. And so Victor is involved in, in Belize and, you know, the sports fishing industry is huge in Belize. Believe I believe as a top. So both of them can add a lot to, you know, weigh in as well. Awesome. Um, so I just want to mention Brian Makati and Felicity Davil. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Felicity, um, for helping to facilitate this session. So again, Mr. Show, would you like to add Ms. Taylor? Yeah, just, just, just wanted to tell Prescott, thanks for having me on. Um, I do agree that we need have to have better management of our natural resources in both here in Belize and the Bahamas. And um, while I missed the, uh, the first part of this segment, it was really insightful to hear what all good work that you guys are doing over there. And um, here in Prescott highlights some of the things that needs to be addressed for you guys to improve management on your end. And we are working on our side as well to get things in order so that we could um, have better management of our resources. I, I personally am um, more involved with the recreational fishing on this side and the need to have better um, secured habitats for that industry to continue to grow. Victor, can you tell them about the program that you did uh, with the children in terms of fly fishing? Tell them a bit about that program for me, please. 
<laughs> yeah, here in Belize, um, we we started to notice that um, there's there there's a need for us to do a lot of on the ground work with the local communities to get them not more not only more involved in recreational fishing, but them to start to realize that it's a real career path as far as the um, salary they could potentially earn and being high level anglers and guides. Um, so every summer we work along with communities to get 10, um, this year actually it was 20, 20 um, youths that are around the high school age um, and get them involved in a summer camp with along with experienced guides to teach them the basics on how to um, cast, how to tie the flies, how to navigate the waters. Uh, to open their eyes to the potential of that being a career path after they get out of high school, if they don't see um, university as an option for them. As you all know, we need, we don't need everyone to go to the university. The university isn't meant for everyone. There are a lot of guys that are good at their hands um, doing technical and vocational um, work that can make a handsome living. And recreational fishing is definitely one of those if we're if we're talking about how much um, the industry can potentially make for the locals. So it's something that we want to highlight and we want to get more Belizeans involved in. Victor, one final thing I want you to share is very important. How much, how many uh, full-time guides you have in Belize presently, Platts guides? Um, I believe the estimate right now is between 1,500 to 2,000 jobs from recreational fishing um, alone. But um, I, I should say the caveat to this is that this was pre-COVID and you know that um, COVID hit us really hard here in Belize. I believe that within the region, we were the um, reported to um, be the country that would suffer the most from loss of tourism activity. So that number probably, has dwindled down um, a bit, but we still have a really strong um, guiding community here. But but I why, why I asked that, Victor, because I can tell you, when I first went to the cabinet in the Bahamas, but Victor back then they had a few dozen guides in Belize. So Belize have over a thousand full-time guides and the Bahamas have 400. And so I went around for 20 years training guides and it was met with nothing but resistance in the Bahamas because we can want to follow a colonial tourism model. And so the point I'm making at Belize is a role model for us. They have the flats, they got the bonefish top and permit, but they have persons like Victor, as you could see, even the program with the, in the high school so these are things that, you know, we talk about working between three of our countries, Belize, Cuba, the Bahamas, so that we can work even with the students that they're training. Imagine them having exchange where they can come to the Bahamas. The ones in the Bahamas can go to Belize, can go to Cuba. We can have that type of networking between us. And I'll just show you an example. The um, America spends 50 plus billion dollars on sports fishing. Our whole economy that we like to brag about is about $14 billion. The US spends 156 billion on outdoor recreational activity. So we have not scratched the surface when you talk about true potential in Belize and the Bahamas and you know other countries with these resources. But a lot of times we have pushback from special interests who prefer to have, you know, the mega hotel and we have some jobs in there. But this type of tourism he's talking about, the revenue trickles down to right to the grassroots throughout the communities. And so- Thank you. Thank you for mentioning that. That's definitely yeah. something that we have to um, look into. I just want to get those uh, comments from those other persons and then I'm going to come back to you, Mrs. Smith. Um, is there okay. anything else you'd like to add, Mr. K. Smith, Ms. Taylor? Is there anything else you'd like to add before we close? Um, if, if, I, if I were to go first, um, in a nutshell, um, I think what Victor highlights is, is part of our way forward. Because we could talk until we've blown the face, but we need to know how to move forward. 
And essentially, because you have someone like Victor here on this chat, is one of the things that the Bahamas need to do more of. I know Prescott has been almost single-handedly doing what I'm suggesting, and that is going to different places, um, participating with bringing um, uh, the activities of other countries to our knowledge here. We need to involve it in our school system. When I was in high school some time ago, um, agriculture was a part of the school curriculum. Um, and I think Pinlane, uh, that is Selendian Pinlane, the, the leader of our nation back then, part of our nation, had the right approach. And I would invite all other people who would serve in that high office to, uh, 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 to adopt the same kind of approach. Um, fly fishing, we, we mean the Prescott, the Prescott leadership, we've had a very difficult time. And mind you, you're talking about 400 plus guys throughout the Bahamas that did not have a function of making a, a living. We need to get away, Ms. Moss, away from the sun, sea, and sand concept of tourism. Because right now, Prescott is talking about 400 guys. They are part of the touristic product. But guess what? They're using the natural resources. They're using the natural environment of Bahamas for, pe for people uh, who've been coming here for years. Prescott's father started a, 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 um, um, something in, uh, what's, the, what's, the, what's the key call again, Prescott? In, yes, yes. Yeah, the Bind Bind Club. The Bind Bind Club, which is one of the keys somewhere in the middle of um, Central Amherst. And that was done back in the 20s and 30s. And yes. so you see, these are the kind of things that we need to get people involved with. Do not believe that just because people come here to see the beaches, to enjoy the beaches, that's not the only thing. That is not the only thing. And so we need to get down to the modern, but we need to join hands with other um, um, countries around in the region. And we need to teach people what it is that we have here and, and get the guys, uh, the guides, I mean, the guides to go on these boats to learn from Prescott, Smiths, and those in the world so they can know how to um, take advantage of this business in the Bahamas. And um, if we do that, we'll be fine. But I, the challenge is for the powers that be to really take heat. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith, Mr. K. Smith. Um, and I'll jump back to you, Mr. P. Smith. Is there any, any final comments you would like to add while we close? Yes. Um, you know, I am deeply passionate about seeing uh, people truly free. And the only way that's going to happen is through the model of conservation that empowers our people with the skills that they need to use the many resources we have in a sustainable way, not the model of conservation. And let's look at the word conservation, to conserve. When you hear somebody say, I'm a conservative, they're talking about conserving the status quo. You and I were never part of the equation when it came to the status quo. And so, like Denzel Washington say, if ain't nothing in the dictionary says positive about you being Black, then we write our own dictionary. And so conservation, uh, we, inherit, we tend to follow things that are not in our best interest instead of looking at developing what is best for the Belizean, what is best for Bohemians. And so, I want to see thousands of Bahamian trained with the skills in ecotourism, uh, owning lodges. We should own marinas through our country. And you're talking about the kind of benefits that is sustainable for generations unborn and not just a model that enriches the few to the detriment of our environment. Thank you. Thank you. I, I want to say thank you to our, our guests for joining us today, for sharing your insight and knowledge to the two Smiths. Wow. Very interesting. Powerful. <laughs> thank you for joining us today. Um, and so I would like to thank those. Um, like and share this page. If you have any commentary, feel free to add your comments under our videos. We want to know your thoughts. We want to know what you think. We definitely want to continue uh, this topic we want to continue this discussion um this is we're all about sharing knowledge and so you can subscribe to 
our YouTube channel. Can we talk? Follow us on Instagram and Twitter using the addresses provided on our page. And remember, let's think, talk, do. Thank you. Have a good evening, everyone.